Well, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking, I have been looking forward to uh, coming here, telling you a bit about uh, my research. Uh, some, uh, the, the things I'm going to present you now is uh, uh, some of it is based on my um, uh, existing research and some of it is, um, is work in progress. So that would, you are warned. Uh, I have uh, revised my title slightly. Uh, and it's now effective indicators of play, play as creativity, <coughs> and cultivation processes of building. And I'm going to talk a lot about building. And building is a strange concept in English because it is, in fact, a German word. But uh, normally uh, in English, you use uh, the, the word building to describe the cultivation of character, the formation of personality, uh, which is. Uh, uh, um, this concept of building, which is this German concept, and I will come back to it, but just if you uh, wondered, what is this? Um, my background is that I am now an uh, educational uh, philosopher at the uh, Department of Education, I think I choose to call it, at DPU, uh, Aarhus, Aarhus University, and my background is that I, am, I have a Master in History of Ideas from this university, I have a PhD uh, from sociology at uh, Copenhagen University, uh, and then I've, I've uh, uh, been at uh, DPU for several uh, years. And I have uh, researched a lot in um, my, my research is uh, in very much in the oh it doesn't it doesn't seem to work. <coughs> Yeah, it was. Oh, the computer just froze. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Works very fluently until it doesn't. You showed a picture. It's uh, 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 my latest book, uh, Creativity, A Question of Bildung, is the title in English. And I also wrote uh, a couple of uh, articles in English, and I have a list of references at the bottom. And I don't know, uh, it, it, do you hand up slides in, in this uh, in this boot camp? Or? Um, can? You can if you want to. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a possibility. All right. Great. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, um, uh, these uh, five things today. I will uh, start with uh, presenting my research approach to uh, play and then I'm going to talk about uh, play as cultivation, play as creativity and I'm trying to uh, uh, conceptualize those in uh, the notion of building. So I'm, I'm trying, I, I will try to, to, uh, to, uh, to show you how cultivation can be seen as the processes of building and the point is here that, that uh, that using the notion of building, crea creativity and cultivation uh, is looked upon as affective processes. And that's the point. That's the uh, kind of new uh, approach to uh, cultivation, creativity and play. And uh, then I'll try to say what is uh, play uh, when you look at it as creativity processes, as cultivation processes, and I will end up trying to identify what are then the effective indicators of play. So that's uh, in the end. And then I actually have an idea how you could observe it, maybe. So, yeah. But mostly my presentation today is conceptualization. It's theory development. Uh, I'm an, uh, I am an educational uh, philosopher, so that's, uh, that's what I do. And then actually also I do a diagnosis of the times, which is... Uh, 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 yeah, also, so, and, and I will uh, say a little bit about that, but not, but not very much. Most of it, it's a conceptualization of play as a process of cultivation and creativity. Yeah, my point of departure is that in order to understand uh, 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 something, in order to observe something, we have to understand it. We need theory to uh, observe, to understand what's going on uh, around us. And uh, and, and that's uh, my point of departure. I have two assumptions uh, uh, about uh, play. The one is that play is, uh, in my point of view, and from the point of view of building and creativity, it's, it, it is 
uh, in fact, the original form of human creativity. It's the first form or instance of combining something into something new. Um, and combining things that are not usually combined, that are not usually put uh, together. And uh, creativity is the original form of this, and then it develops into humor, into art, into uh, science, uh, in creativity, uh, and even in, uh, into innovation. And creativity is uh, the act of creating something new, creating a new idea, whereas innovation is to carry out the new idea, to make value of uh, a new uh, idea. And in my uh, perspective, play is the source of that. And play is uh, also, on the other hand, the original form of uh, being a human being, being a social uh, being. And that is very, uh, that is very um, uh, obvious in play, because uh, play, when children are playing, they are uh, often, um, they often uh, displays and talks about that they, they have an intense feeling of togetherness. They are uh, really ex ex uh, experiencing uh, what it is to be together with other human beings. And it's, it's quite um, interesting when you uh, ask uh, children, uh, well, who do you play with? They always say, my friends. And when you ask them, who are your friends? They will say, they're the ones I play with. So it's, it, for children, it's the same. Uh, and uh, the more they have played together, uh, the longer they have played together, the more intense they play together, the better friends they are. And it, I actually think that this could be seen as the source of later forms of community, especially the kind of community that uh, Simmel talks about, the, the sociologist, when he talks about uh, the pure kind of sociality. The pure kind of sociality is sociability. It's, it's when you are uh, together with others for the sake of being together with others. You're not together with others uh, for the sake of um, earning money, or for the sake of doing a project, or for the sake of, um, of uh, 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 having a political project or something like that. No, you're together for the sake of being together. That's sociality. And um, play seems to be the, the original form of this. So, in this point of view, play is quite important. It, it's important uh, to us as human beings, as social beings, it's important, and it's more important today, because creativity innovation is more and more important in order to get a job uh, in uh, the future. What are problems then? Well, there's a pr there's, uh, there are several problems. The most obvious problem is that creativity is a very difficult concept. Uh, actually, it's one of the most uh, resistant, uh, one of the, one of the uh, concepts that are most resistant to conceptualization. Um, there are uh, a consensus on the definition of the creative product, of the product, the result of the creative process. And usually you will find this uh, uh, definition and it says that in order for an idea to be creative, it should be both novel and useful. It should be novel and relevant. It should be novel and appropriate. It, it's always these two. It's not enough that it's, uh, it, that it's new, that it's novel. It, 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 it should have some kind of meaningfulness uh, in it. But this is, uh, this is a definition of the product. The process uh, leading up to this product, resulting in this product, uh, there are no consensus uh, about. And... Um, uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, debated in research on creativity whether or not this, uh, this uh, process is mysterious or not, whether or not uh, we should look into it or not. Um, and this debate actually goes back to uh, one of the church fathers, Augustine, who was uh, the first to talk about creativity in the modern uh, sense, when he said that uh, there is one person able of, able, uh, capable of creating out of nothing, Creatio ex nihilo, and that is the biblical God. God was the first person to be creative, and then the children. But um, yeah, he was the first. Well, it's a long debate, and uh, and, uh, and and it's still a debate uh, today. When you look at, at the at the research, uh, a lot of the focus, a lot of the uh, researchers' focus is actually not on describing the creative process. 
spot on describing different kinds of preconditions for creativity. Uh, this is very obvious uh, 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 with uh, the modern research on creativity, which focuses focus, focus on uh, ability. That was uh, Guilford, uh, and he wanted to uh, identify which abilities are characteristic to creative people. Uh, what are uh, uh, how could you, how can we measure them? How can we test them? And uh, and and that uh, was um, uh, the ground for the Torrance uh, creative test. Um, of creativity, the, the, the Torrance test of creativity, and uh, later on it, it, it was about personality traits characteristic to creative people, but not the process. It was always, what are the preconditions for being creative? Uh, today, uh, in current research, it's much about what are the learning environment characteristic of uh, groups that are creative, what are the teaching environment characteristic of uh, these people, and it's uh, Cropley, it's uh, Kraft, it's a lot of researchers uh, from England, uh, known as uh, researchers uh, around uh, creativity in education. Uh, the, the, the concept of building is also uh, quite uh, confused. It's often confused with the, the notions of identity, which is the prevailing notion of the self, the individual today. Uh, it is very much in, in a Danish context uh, confused with the concept of personal and social competences with the self-actualization self and, uh, and so on. And then there's uh, another problem that is, uh, in my point of view, uh, the prevailing discourse on play today. And the prevailing discourse on, the play, on, on uh, play today is the discourse that talks about play and learning. Learning and play. Playful learning, uh, learning for play uh, and, and so on. And the, the, the basic assumption of this discourse is that play is not a means, it's not an end in itself. Play is a means to something else. It's a means to learning. And uh, it started as a positive message. It started uh, as a message that, that said, oh, well, play is not, uh, it's not uh, useless, it's not uh, futile. Why? Because children learn when, when they play. They develop social competences, they develop personal <coughs> competences, and so on. Um, uh, and, uh, and play in this discourse is seen very much as a means of making learning more effective, more exciting. And, and it is. Research point to that. Uh, research substantiate uh, this claim. Uh, it, it is an effective tool of uh, enhancing learning. The problem is play, and that's my point, play is, is more than that. Play is also an end in itself. And um, my, uh, uh, my um, uh, basic assumption is that play is actually no, uh, uh, primarily uh, about creativity, about uh, cultivation. And uh, uh, the focus should not only be that to, to use play as means for uh, improving learning, but also, and more importantly, maybe the primary focus should be on play as, as a process of uh, cultivation and creativity. Not least because these processes are much more important today as they used to be. Well, it's, it's, it has always been important to, uh, to cultivate your character. It's always been important, of course, to be a social human being, to be um, to be a human, but it seems that that, uh, that these processes are even uh, more important today. And what is more, it's even uh, as I mentioned b b before, it's more important to foster creativity. And one of the reasons uh, is that uh, that uh, uh, there is uh, that um, we have we are seeing right now that there are tendencies uh, in employment that. We see a lot of uh, automation due to uh, computerization, due to robotics, uh, and uh, uh, it, it seems that what is most resistant to, automati to, to automation is in fact creativity, is in fact innovation. We haven't seen a robot, we haven't seen a computer being creative or being innovative. And if we want to prepare the children for the future, uh, for future employment, uh, this is one of the ways to do it. It is to make them creative and innovative. 
So we have to, to, uh, to ask ourselves, what is the source of creativity? What is to be uh, developed? Uh, and uh, play, uh, it seems, is, one, is the original form of this. All right. That was the background, you might say. Um, uh, in my research, I'm trying to uh, conceptualize uh, creativity and uh, conservation uh, and play. And it's simply because there's a need for it. There is a gap in research. Uh, it's uh, difficult to conceptualize creativity. And, uh, and it's not the focus of uh, lots of researchers. My contribution here is to try to, to, to say, could we use the notion of building uh, to understand play better, to understand the processes, the creative processes, the cultivation processes of play uh, better, of, of creativity <coughs> better. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the concept of Bildung, uh, or Danish in Danish, or Bildning in uh, Swedish, um, uh, is, a, uh, is an old um, uh, German uh, concept, is in fact the new humanistic concept uh, of uh, the cultivation of character, uh, um, and I'll um, come back to that uh, quite, quite um, uh, in a moment. Um, I also draw uh, a lot about uh, a lot on uh, some of the original insights of uh, creativity and uh, innovation. Uh, Poincaré, uh, the great mathematician, Kessler, the great author, and Schumpeter, the great uh, economist. Uh, and in my point of view, they they. Uh, they have original insights on creativity and innovation that are in fact forgotten today. And this is uh, a typical method of philosophers, you might say. Philosophers usually go back uh, in, in time to thinkers because we know that insights are forgotten. But what, what is, uh, what is um, uh, 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 the struggle then is to take these original insights and uh, apply them to the problems of today, apply them to the problems uh, we deal with uh, today. Yeah, but using this concept of uh, building, um, the point of using that is to say the process of creativity is not something that we just understand. It's not something that is mysterious either. It is in fact effective. It is effective processes, and that is what I'm trying to uh, to. Uh, to present here today, and in the end, I will try to identify what are then the effective indicators of creativity, of cultivation, and in play. And the idea is, if you have the effective indicators, then you can test them. So that's the whole idea here. Yeah, in my um, new book, uh, the book that I'm writing right now, uh, I uh, try once again to deal with uh, with Bildung or Danish in Danish. <coughs> Uh, and, and it is this concept that, that will not go away. It, it keeps coming up. And dance it keeps coming up because uh, it, it usually is the concept for something that is, that is uh, important in school and it, in education, but is usually not described in the study plans or, in, or, or anywhere else. And in my research, I tried to, to say, what is the most simple definition on building? And building is a, it's, it, creativity is a difficult uh, concept. Building is also a difficult uh, concept. And of course, they are difficult because they are so basic uh, to humans. Uh, they, they describe most basically what it, what, what it is to be human, to be able to create, to be able to think, to be able to be together with other people in, in a culture, in a community. Um, so so they, are, uh, they are difficult. But th this is my way of saying, how, how can we... Uh, say it most uh, simple. Um, so it's like a formula in, uh, in, in physics, something like that. And my point is that uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can actually understand the building as the third dimension of education. The, the, the two uh, 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 other dimensions uh, we know very well. It's knowledge. What is knowledge about? Well, if you have knowledge, then, then you can uh, take bearings uh, uh, either in practice or in theory. Uh, knowledge is, uh, according to the common definition, substantiated assumptions of relationships. And uh, usually it is acquired through a teaching process. It could also be an individual, an individual teaching process, like reading, for example, 
but uh, you are taught how are these relationships uh, uh, in, in reality. And uh, then we have ability. Knowledge is the input, uh, usually ability is the output. What is the student capable of after uh, uh, going, going through this course? And uh, ability is, uh, is not about uh, taking bearings. Ability is about being capable of doing something. If you have skills, then you can carry out acts, you can bicycle, you can analyze. If you have qualifications, you can solve tasks. It could be, um, if you have teacher uh, qualifications, then you can solve teacher tasks. And competences, uh, which we have uh, talked a lot of uh, the, the last uh, couple of decades, competences, it, competencies is about handling challenges. And a challenge is really just a task that you do not know, uh, a task that, uh, that is uh, new to you uh, and then that you have to handle. Um, and and the, the, the point is that uh, you uh, develop uh, abilities through learning processes. Uh, building, on the other way, is neither something that you acquire through teaching process or develop through learning process, but something that you cultivate through a cultivation process. So th this is a concept for what is it that you also learn except uh, from knowledge besides from abilities, that there is something more happening uh, to you. And uh, the idea is to describe building as a way of relating. It, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's not in opposition to knowledge or ability. Uh, actually, they are dimensions of the same thing, of the same process. In order to relate to yourself, in order to relate to others, in order to relate to the world or to the task before you, you have to have knowledge, you have to have abilities to be capable of doing something. But the idea there is that, that uh, it, it's, it, it depends upon how you relate to the task, to what you're doing, how you use your abilities, how you use your, uh, your knowledge. That is building. And, and the process of building is about changing one's way of relating. And that's the important <coughs> uh, thing. Um, and this is, you, you could of course call, call cultivation a kind of a learning process, because something is happening to you. But it's different from what we usually, uh, uh, what we usually call learning, and especially in the discourse of learning. In the discourse of learning, it's always acquiring knowledge and developing competences uh, and skills. So it's using the concept of building, using uh, the concept of cultivation is to say it's, it's something different. It's, uh, it's, it's a transformation process that is different uh, from learning understood as uh, developing uh, skills and competences. Okay, what is this concept of building then? And I go back here to the, to the new humanistic uh, concept. Maybe some of you uh, uh, know it. But the point about this uh, 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 concept is that it is a process of cultivation, cultivating your personality or formating your, um, your character. And the idea is that you can only develop your personality through the social, through community, through engaging in society, uh, and so on. Um, and that's the, uh, uh, that's the main point of this, uh, of this uh, concept. And it differs from other concepts that, uh, that uh, talks about the same kind of social uh, development process, uh, for example, upbringing, for example, uh, uh, socialization. And the difference is that building is, all, is, is always uh, going on in, in freedom. You, you have to be free to cultivate your personality. You have to be free to, uh, to, form, your, uh, to form your character. And that is in opposition to socialization. Socialization usually happens uh, behind your back, which is the, the typical metaphor in sociology for it. Uh, it's, it's unconscious. It's something that, that uh, happens to you. You take over the values, the practices of the society that you are uh, living in. But building is a kind of free socialization process, a process in which you, you actively 
change, you actually take over values and practices and so on. So it's also described as self-action, self-initiative, uh, self, uh, 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 and you, of course, recognize uh, these concepts from play also. Then there are two processes. Uh, you could say freedom is the condition of building. And building is, the, the process of building is, is then, uh, um, uh, has, has, has two processes, consists of two processes. A transcendence process, and that's a, that's a process in which you transcend your, your own world, that is, you transcend your, old, uh, your own beliefs, your, your own preferences, your own attitudes, and you involve in or engage in a greater world. Uh, that greater world could, can be many things. Many things. It can be a different culture. It could be education. It could be a, 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 a new theory. It could be uh, the, the world of, a, a, of another person, and so on. And uh, a concrete example of it is the educational journey, or the Bildungsreise, or Dannelsesreise in Danish. And that has this classical, um, the, this uh, classical model of uh, home. You start at home in yourself, then you transcend. You, you travel abroad into the greater world, and then you go home again. And the whole idea is that if it is actually cultivation, if it is a, a building process, then when you come home, you're not uh, entirely yourself. Something has happened to you. Um, and what has happened to you is that you have gained an experience. And gaining an experience is that, that you experience that things are different than you thought, uh, not, not just in, uh, as knowledge, but as a, 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 a basic way of understanding, of uh, living, of, of uh, experiencing the world. And that can be uh, described in, in my concepts as uh, you have undergone a transformation process, process in which your way of relating <coughs> has changed a little bit. Then there is also a judgment process, and, and they are very, uh, they are very, um, uh, the, the new uh, humanists um, really stress this. It's, it's not only transcendence or uh, elevation into the universal, to take Hegel's uh, formulation, it's always also a process of judgment. It's a process of development taste um, of uh, which greater world should I engage with, how should I uh, 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 develop, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, the sign of this is that, that you cannot talk about building without talking about ideals of building and models of building. And in the, for the new humanists, the, 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 the ideal was that, that you should become uh, a universal human. So the, the ideal was uh, humanity and the model, the concrete model uh, uh, for this were the ancient Greeks. And the, the idea was simply that, um, that the ancient Greeks was the most, most vigorous expression, the culture that most vigorously expressed what it is to be human. So in order to cultivate yourself as a human, you have to, you have to socialize with the Greeks. And that's actually the, the way they uh, it describes it. Uh, actually, they called the ancient Greeks just the ancients because they were so familiar with them. Uh, and Kant, uh, the way you develop taste is by imitating the patterns of the ancients. That is, you imitate the way they relate to themselves, to the world, and to others. <coughs> okay, in my uh, research, uh, in my uh, um, uh, uh, former book, uh, which I showed, I, I raised the question, well then, what brings about Bildung? What drives the process of building? What brings about this change in one's way of uh, relating? Uh, what is the, the driver, the force behind these uh, transformations? And uh, the reason why this question comes up is because it's obvious that building cannot be a question of having abilities, having skills, having competences. Because skills and competences is always bound to the subject. It's always a person who has skills. It's always a, a person who has uh, competences. And you see that on the, C, on, on, on the uh, 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 curriculum vitae, uh, uh, for example. 
And, and what is going on in this process of, of building is that the subject uh, is actually transformed in the process. It's transcended. It's overrun in the process. So it, it, it couldn't be the subject. Um, so what is it? And uh, it seems as though what is happening is that, that something happens to you in the building process. Um, you, 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 you can have taste for how to relate, how to be open to these transformations, but you cannot intend to build, to get built it, <laughs> you might say. You cannot, uh, in, you cannot intentionally say, I want to cultivate myself, and then something happens. You might go on an educational journey for one year, come back, and nothing happens. So, something happens to you. And I, uh, I have tried to use the idea of, uh, of uh, forces, maybe that are uh, sensuous or affective forces, uh, that drives this transformation process. And, and uh, when I use the term force, it's, it's in the most simple way. A force is something that brings about change. So it's, it's not that there is a subject behind the change. Like in gravity, there, there's not, uh, you, you talk about the force of gravity, there's not a subject pulling in you or pulling in the sun, or, uh, but we see that, that there are a force at hand here and it brings about change. And the idea is, how can we characterize these changes? Uh, and, uh, and my uh, work for, us, for, for it is to talk about sensuous forces or affective uh, force, forces. And the reason why I choose to, to, to say that is that they seem to be based on affective processes. Uh, especially the uh, transcendent process, the adjustment process, seems to be based on emotions uh, and moods. And if you think it's been abstract until now, <laughs> then just forget it, because this is more abstract. And, and I, I didn't plan this when I wrote uh, my book and did my research, but I was forced into this. And, and uh, actually, the, the idea came, I, I, I was looking for the force of judgment and the force of transcendence, and then I uh, bumped into Kant, and you usually bump into Kant uh, some, uh, somewhere along, uh, along the line, and actually he talks about another force of, uh, another kind of force, the force of the imagination, the Einbildungskraft. And Kant says that the Einbildungskraft is a blind but indispensable function of the soul. Actually, quite indispensable, because with, without this, we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't create uh, synthesis, uh, we couldn't have cognition at all. Uh, so it, it's debated very much how can we understand this force of imagination uh, with Kant. Uh, so, I was looking for these two forces, um, uh, effective forces, and then the force of imagination popped up, and then I, I was thinking four, so I had to uh, have a fourth also. <coughs> and uh, luckily, uh, there are uh, uh, wise people before me with, who, has, uh, who has talked about uh, this, and uh, I could actually recognize the force of the imagination was Kant. That's quite obvious, and he describes it as this blind but indispensable force. And he actually says that it is affected. It's based on sense impressions. Uh, and it results in a new, uh, a, a new synthesis. Um, and the idea is, uh, how about the other forces? And, and Kahn comes up only nine years later with, of course, the concept of aesthetic uh, judgment. Um, and uh, what is quite interesting is that is, this is a kind of judgment which is not based on logic, but based on effects, uh, not only uh, uh, effects uh, in general, but specific feelings. Uh, um, aesthetic judgment is based on the feelings of pleasure and displeasure, according to Kant. I think that there are more kinds of effective judgment, not, not only aesthetic judgment, but also other kinds of effective judgment, and they all have uh, in common that they are based on, uh, actually what? Kant calls life feelings, uh, and they are the feelings that are very strong feelings, and that uh, they are the, the feelings that, that motivate very much to action. And it's interest, it's uh, pleasure, uh, it's desire, and it's uh, the, the, the negative um, uh, uh, feelings that corresponds to them. It's like anger, irritation, uh, displeasure, uh, disgust, and so on. 
And what is uh, interesting is that it, 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 it seems that judgment is in fact resulting in a new style, a new way of relating to oneself uh, 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 with, um, with a view to, to judgment. Uh, and then the force of transcendence, uh, you can of course go to all of these, um, uh, all of these thinkers of building. But uh, Nietzsche is one of those who has uh, said it most clearly. Um, uh, and uh, he actually talks about the Dionysian uh, force as a surplus of uh, force, which uh, trends, uh, uh, changes things. And in my, um, and, and I will elaborate this just uh, for an overview, um, they are based on, as, as I can see, this, this force of transcendence is based on not feelings, but moods. A more and, and more precisely, ecstatic moods, moods like cheerfulness, um, enthusiasm, and so on, and it results in a change of mood. Yeah, and then this force is uh, uh, very mysterious, and I had to go to Freud to find something that uh, 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 could resemble it. And it is, I, I call it uh, vitality. In Freud, it's the death principle. He talks about the death principle. And it, is, uh, it seems to be based on uh, aesthetic senses, um, uh, 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 for example, repetition, that is uh, uh, Freud's uh, 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 way of thinking it, and it results in a, a change of state, a, a change of state, and, and that is the whole point. With Freud, he says, the death principle is that you go, you, you are an organic state and you want to return to the unorganic state. That's a death um, uh, principle there. I also see a resemblance in, again, Nietzsche's uh, idea of the uh, Apollon Apollonian and Dionysian principle. And what is uh, interesting is that uh, 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 the principle of Apollon and Dionysus is actually uh, ambiguous. It's actually a uh, double. Uh, it's, it's both, uh, Apollon is both vision, vision and individuation and uh, Dionysian is both this surplus of force, but it's, it's also this mysterious reunion, as he talks about, uh, the reunion of, of man to nature, uh, as he actually says. Uh, so, uh, it seems very abstract, but it's, uh, it's well described. Uh, what I'm doing is that I'm putting these, I call them forces, at the, and I put them together. Uh, and... Um, and then I actually, I think the most concrete uh, example of where these forces come, are, 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 displayed, are, are displayed is actually in something I, I was thinking a lot about uh, when I uh, were, were on uh, parental leave um, some years ago uh, with uh, my own children. And I thought, why does uh, children love so much to play with sand or water? They, they cannot. Go, uh, 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 go uh, uh, on the street and see uh, and see some water without you know they should do something with, with this water and the slime and so on. Why are they so interested in these kind of uh, playground uh, games? And my uh, thesis, and it, it, it is a thesis, but it, just to illustrate, it, it is to say that, that maybe there's a reason why they are uh, so preoccupied with these kinds of playground games. Maybe it's, it could be understood as, the, as, uh, as these forces, these effective forces, being bodily experienced by children. Uh, it, it's very obvious with sand, right? You, you can imagine anything in sand. You can make a cake, you can make a town, whatever. <laughs> and uh, children, uh, they usually cry, look, look what I created, or look at my drawing. Uh, and that is very familiar with, 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 uh, with, with, with uh, vision. Uh, when they're playing with water, I think they're, they're, crying, they're trying to, to, to determine or discern uh, when I'm going to be wet. Uh, for how long can we uh, uphold this kind of activity before it goes wrong? And it, it should go wrong. And they should uh, cry, no, uh, I get what, I get wet. And, and when you're sliding, what you're doing is actually uh, transcendence of the body's gravity. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if you notice it, but usually when children run the slide, they cry, wee! And, and I notice this not only in, in, 
in England or, or, or the States, but also in Denmark and, and, uh, and everywhere. It seems to be an international word for the sliding. <laughs> um, and then again, uh, the, the swing. When you have the swing uh, repeatingly back and forth, back and forth, you, you sometimes see people clo uh, children close their eyes and they're kind of thrown into a state of trance. So maybe that could illustrate it and maybe that could explain why it is so important for children to, to play these games. Also, combination of games, the combination of slide and swing is of course the trampoline, uh, where you swing upside down, uh, and that is also very, um, uh, yeah, I, I try to, uh, I, I try to, uh, to elaborate on that um, uh, with a little piece I wrote on the model, uh, Pelle Nielsen's The Model, who's been uh, uh, exhibited at the, the Arkham Museum. Uh, okay, um, back to Bildung. How, 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 how could this be understood then? Well, I've tried to, to describe the process of uh, Bildung with these uh, stages, and, and uh, I actually think that the one who, who elaborated mostly on the process of Bildung was, was Hegel, but we have to go back to Hegel to, to, to find uh, a, an attempt to do that. Uh, so I've, I've attempted in, in, my, uh, in the book I'm currently uh, uh, writing right now. It seems to start with, with an occasion. It seems to start with the occasion of something is missing. I'm missing something. I'm, I'm not a whole person or something like that. It, it, it's like when you travel, you, you, you see a commercial or you hear people talk about uh, going to France or something like that. Then there's the opening stage. And the, the, the interesting is that in order to get going with this process of, 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 of building. You actually have to reserve or hold back uh, your normal no, your custom no. What, what the, 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 the no that you would um, normally say. Um, and this is a sign of your judgment changing. This is a sign of being, uh, being open to the world in, in a new way. And that is how Cleft says it. The transcendent state, on the other hand, is, uh, as Klafke says, uh, the opening up of the world to the subject. And in, in this um, uh, uh, conceptualization, uh, it's the same as transcending yourself. Transcending your own world, uh, engaging with that greater world. And what is characteristic of this stage is that your mood changes. Your mood changes from uh, being uh, silent or moody up here, and to cheerfulness, to enthusiasm, uh, you're open to the new, you're open to the greater world. The experience stage uh, is the, the third uh, stage in which uh, something happens. Uh, uh, you've been open to a greater world, and uh, something happened, you had gained an experience, your way of relating is changed, and as Gardner says, uh, experience is what always thwarts an expectation. It destroys an expectation. It, it, it destroys your world or your common understanding of uh, things. And this results in a change of mood. It goes from cheerfulness to disturbance. And, and disturbance is also an ecstatic mood, but it's a mood where the novel is experienced as something that is threatening, not opening up new possibilities, but threaten your existence or your, uh, your view on, on life. And this uh, usually reflects, uh, you know, or results in a reflection stage where you uh, try to attempt to put new words on what you have uh, experienced. And this is uh, nowadays usually uh, 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 understood as uh, the process of identity, that you are re-describing the story of yourself <coughs> and the occasion why you're re-describing it is that you have gained experiences that that does that, that you have to re-describe the story of yourself. You have to incorporate what you, do, what you have experienced in your story. Usually, uh, many researchers and others, they focus on this process. I see it as the last process of um, uh, a building their process. Yes. What about creativity then? Well, my idea, and that it was my hope that I were to uh, write my book very fast, uh, unfortunately that uh, wasn't go uh, going to happen, but my idea originally was that there is a hidden similarity 
between the process of creativity and the process of building. And it's quite obvious when you look at the uh, product, the creative product, uh, the definition of that is that it, it is both novel and relevant, as I said in the beginning. You can actually uh, view the novel as the result of a transcendence process. You can view the relevant as a, as a result of a judgment process. Transcendence is that, that you, uh, you break with the existing ways of thinking, um, and uh, the judgment uh, process is that you choose which new combinations are relevant and which combinations are irrelevant. Uh, and if, uh, what is quite interesting is that, uh, that you, it is possible to find description of uh, transcendence and judgment uh, in, uh, in the theories of creativity, but we have to go back. These are, these are original insights, and, and I think that uh, that uh, they are uh, ignored uh, today, and that is uh, and that's a shame because uh, it, it has um, are, they are great insights. Uh, Kussler talks about bisociation, and bisociation uh, he means combining two things that do not uh, that uh, uh, do not normally uh, exist um, uh, in in the same matrix of thought. So when you are creative, you're not just combining like we usually do when we are thinking, then, then we are com combining within an accustomed or existing matrix of thought, but we are combining different matrices of thought, and that's the, that's the uh, definition of creativity. Um, and I think this is uh, often uh, ignored uh, today, and uh, uh, it's, it's, very, it, it's very obvious uh, in uh, uh, those researchers talking about everyday creativity, uh, little c creativity, uh, and uh, so on, uh, and they call, often confuse everyday creativity and learning. Uh, they cannot distinguish between the two, because they say learning is about is creating new combinations. Everyday creativity is about uh, 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 combine, uh, creating new uh, combinations. So what's the difference? And they uh, they overlook that creativity uh, is always combining different matrices of thought, whereas learning is about creating new combinations within an established uh, matrix. Um, so uh, there is uh, the, the, uh, uh, the concept of bisociation is quite important here. Uh, judgment. Uh, Poincaré, the great ma mathematician, talks about uh, uh, discernment uh, in creativity. Poincaré was uh, the father, the, one of the founding fathers of the four stages of the creative process, which is uh, one of the very classical ways of looking at the creative uh, process. And he says, uh, um, to be creative consists precisely in not making useless combinations and in making those which are useful and which are only a small minority. So you have to find the, this, these uh, um, uh, this small minority. Invention, he says, is discernment, it's, it's choice. And not only that, he also says, the rules that guide the choice are fine and delicate. They are felt rather than formulated. And when he says that in his uh, de description, he actually reproduces Kant's idea of aesthetic uh, judgment. And that's quite interesting. And this is also the reason why it, that it's, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to make computers and, and robots uh, creative, because it's very difficult to write algorithms uh, that describes what is uh, what is uh, the, the determining ground for uh, uh, a creative uh, 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 combination, and and this is one of the main reasons why creativity appears to be uh, still a unique human capacity, which is uh, resistant uh, um, uh, to automation. Yes, the four stages of uh, the process uh, described uh, uh, or re rethought in this uh, perspective, uh, you, you, you can say that also here there is an occasion when we are creative, and usually we think of this as uh, inspiration, right? The, the awakening of an interest, the muse, the awakening of an irritation, which is uh, probably what researchers uh, um, uh, experience when, when they are uh, inspired 
to creativity, it's it's usually irritation. I, I think it's a concept that irritates you or something that um, some other thing. Uh, the preparation state is the first stage where you uh, investigate uh, problems in all uh, directions, and uh, the idea is if, if it is a creative process, then it will end in frustration because you, you kind of figure out the problem. Uh, the incubation stage is is uh, is simply uh, described as the state, the stage that makes create, uh, creativity mysterious. This is the mysterious stage. What is uh, mysterious is how do you come from the preparation stage when you're constantly working with uh, the problem and to the elimination stage in which the new idea suddenly appears. And it appears suddenly uh, and, and something has been going on here, but it's quite mysterious. Uh, Poincaré, say, uh, um, uh, Poincaré um, describes it as a semi-hypnotic state. It, you're not asleep, but you're not awake. And usually, he described how he got his best ideas as a great mathematician. He got them uh, in bed in the evening, in the bath in the morning, and on the bus. And this is uh, called the three Bs. Uh, where you get your new ideas, and uh, Bowden uh, makes fun of this, I think we have to uh, understand why it is so. Why is it so? And, and it's, it's reproduced by uh, scientists, uh, artists, uh, it's, it's, it's so common. And, and what seems to go on here is that, that you are in a disturbing mood uh, in, in the back of your head. Something is not quite right. Uh, that is the effective process of transcendence, uh, and then there is this descendant process with which Poincaré describes as the workings of a subliminal self. What that is, he, he couldn't quite figure out. But he just said it, it, it wasn't conscious, but something is going on. And then the new idea comes and mood changes to un uh, enthusiasm, which uh, Sitzen Mikhailich describes as flow. Um, and uh, you uh, adjust and relate the new idea. What is interesting with Kussler is not only his concept of uh, by association, but also that he distinguishes three main types of creativity. And uh, uh, the two of them we know, but, but his, his idea is that, that they are different kinds of ways of combining elements. Uh, in, when, 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 we have, uh, when we create an idea, as we usually do in, in research and discovery, it's a fusion of elements. Uh, it's a new intellectual thesis. Uh, in art, it's uh, usually a, an expression, and it's not a, f a fusion, it's a, it's a confrontation of, of, uh, of, of elements which is held together by uh, a piece of art. And then, and he's famous for that, he, he says humor is the third kind of uh, creativity, and it's not a fusion, it's not a confrontation, it's actually a collision of elements. And it's passing because you cannot hold them together, and it's ending in laughter. Uh, and what's interesting is that they dominate the, the different stages. Uh, the boring stages are one and four, that's for researchers. Uh, the the uh, disturbing stages is for art, and of course humor is in the third stage of elimination of enthusiasm. And the idea is here to, to, to ask, what about play? What about play? He doesn't say anything about play. We know play is children's way of being creative. What about play? And, and of course, the mood of the third stage, uh, the enthusiastic, the, uh, the uh, illumination of new ideas, uh, points to that it, it is perhaps uh, a, a, a variation of humor. The, the difference seems to be that it, it's also a collision of elements. But uh, these elements are not ending in laughter. They are constituting the uh, imaginary universe of play. And that's the idea. So um, how, can we, how, can we, uh, uh, how, how can we understand uh, this? Well, if, if we look at it, if, if it is, in fact, uh, a, a collision of elements when children are playing, then it's, it's because they're combining two elements that are, that are incompatible. They, 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 they can't be together. Um, and, and the way of combining elements 
says, uh, says Kuzler, is by means of similarity. So you find a similarity between two things from two different matrices and you put them together. Uh, Vygotsky's classical example <coughs> would be the concept of the horse, where he sees the, 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 the boy sees a horse riding uh, uh, outside the window, and, and a stick lying there. And this is similarity is that you can use the stick as a horse, and then you're riding. And, and of course, this is a, 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 a collision because they do not uh, belong together. Um, but the collision constitutes the imaginary universe of uh, play. So we can actually see that what is the creative product? Well, it, it's, it's not the drawing uh, or anything else. It's the imaginary universe itself. And play can actually be looked upon as an extended joke. Because you have a collision. And instead of laughing, then you're playing in it. And uh, it's, it's not passing, but, but it's temporary. And it, 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 it ends. And what is the mood of play? Well, it's cheerful, it's enthusiastic. Uh, also, the, the, the classic uh, theorist uh, uh, it, it always describes play as pleasant and so on. I think we have to, to conceptualize it as, as uh, moods. As, uh, that is what is characteristic about play. And there are two different moods, and, and I think we have to take moods seriously. Because moods is how we are being in the world, uh, they, uh, uh, they show us how we relate uh, to the world uh, in general. And when you're cheerful, you're open to others' ideas, you're open to your own ideas, and that seems to be a pre precondition for play. And, and exactly when, uh, when we see play as this ping-pong dynamic, mm -hmm. where you say something, and then uh, your friend says something that builds upon it, and you laugh, and you do it, and you repeat it, and you play. Uh, when you're enthusiastic, uh, it's not an openness, it's, uh, it's more that, uh, that you see that, that the, the play that, that, that you're having is making possible new meaning. Uh, for example, when, when the, uh, children are playing with a moon car, and they are turning it over, and they put it uh, to uh, the sandbox, uh, they actually could use the moon car upside down uh, to make a sand fountain. And they were enthusiastic about that. It, it was great, they'd never seen anything like, like that. And, and usually when you're enthusiastic, uh, uh, the voices uh, get louder. It's, it's a very uh, um, yeah, a typical indicator. What is then the cultivation processes uh, of uh, play? Yeah, well, you're, you're transcending yourself into greater, greater worlds. So what, what are these greater worlds? Well, they are these imaginary universes that you create, often with your, your friends, together with your friends. And what is typical is that, that you're together for the sake of being together uh, with them, uh, and, and that is uh, this original kind of sociability. Uh, you are Transcending yourself in play, often that is also a precondition. When you play house, for instance, you pretend that you're the mother, or the big sister, or the father, except the father is always gone, right? Uh, but then you could be the dog. Um, but usually in imaginary play, you pretend to be someone else, and that is quite important. It is. It, it, it's, it, it is to transcend yourself. It's the original form of uh, transcending uh, yourself. It's a trans self-transcending exercise. Um, yeah. And what, uh, what's the difference between children and adults is that it's easier for children, children to transcend themselves because they have a less self to transcend. And therefore, usually, uh, the, they are, they're not so disturbed uh, in, in this conservation uh, uh, process uh, they're usually just moody or silent, uh, as I see it. Um, play is also judgment. It's very much about holding back an accustomed no. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's being open to playing with, uh, with different persons. It's being open to playing different games. And it is also very much about developing taste of judgment. You, you'll have to be good at uh, uh, contributing with relevant ideas to play, relevant activities to play, uh, and so on. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, I can see the time is running out, so just, um, 
it's, it's just to say that, that there are differences of playing pre in, in preschool and primary school. This is my take on it. I, uh, but uh, preschool is very much imaginary play, and then uh, it's it's different kinds of plays in primary school. But I just uh, go on to here to um, these last words I have. Uh, okay, building on this, what are then the indicators of uh, of of play? Well, uh, there are many uh, indications of these forces of creativity and uh, uh, conservation. And uh, one is that they are uh, based on effects. The other one is that they are processes of uh, transformation. And the third is that they bring about change. And, and the change they bring about is in creativity, a creative product, product and in conservation and building, you gain an experience. Um, all right, so what are the effective indicators then? Well, the effective indicators are, as, as I've indicated, these uh, ecstatic moods. And uh, ecstatic moods are moods uh, that uh, I define, uh, I have to say, there's not a lot of research on moods, as different ways of relating um, uh, where you're open to the novel. As uh, I, I've indicated, in, in cheerfulness, which is central to sociability, uh, you're open to the ideas of others and also to the ideas of yourself. Uh, um, in, in conservation, uh, it's the dominant mood in the transcendent stage. In creativity, it's, it's the whole precondition of play. You cannot play if you're not open. Uh, it's the same with humor. You cannot be social uh, and sociable if you're not open to the others' uh, crazy ideas. Uh, enthusiasm, there, uh, um, on the other hand, is realizing the possibilities of the novel uh, in creativity, uh, it's the dominant mood of the elimination stage uh, and disturbance. That's uh, experiencing the, the novel as something that is that is not uh, uh, making possible new things, but is in fact threatening your own ideas of things. In creativity, that is in the incubation stage, and in conservation, it's the in, uh, experience uh, experience stage. All right. What about play then? Um, uh, well, uh, uh, the effective in indicators of uh, effective judgment uh, that would be uh, in, cre in creativity or in cre creative processes uh, that would be uh, judgment based on interest or irritation um, uh, and uh, in play it's about, as I said, having a good sense of what are the relevant ideas, what are relevant contributions or it can also be uh, how do I respond to other uh, to the other children's uh, contributions and new ideas and you confirm them by laughing, for example, or you confirm them by repeating their ideas. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, you are good at arousing interest for uh, plays, ideas of play, uh, and in cultivation it's uh, about, uh, and, and this is work in progress, uh, it seems to be based on desire and disgust, that is different feelings, but still these life feelings. Uh, and uh, in, in play, it's about having a sense of what could be interesting ways of relating, what should I imitate, what patterns should I imitate. Uh, and and the, the, the feeling here is that desire to become part of something bigger, something greater, the community of play, or to become bigger. Also, much play is about being bigger. All right. So, the indicators of play. Uh, the indicators of transformation, then, is uh, the stages of creativity. There is a shift in mood, uh, from, from disturbing to enthusiastic mood. The stages of cultivation, uh, there is a shift in mood from uh, uh, enthusiastic to disturbing uh, mood. Uh, and we will see this in play, but as I, as I said, in, in, the disturbing mood in play is, is probably more, mostly expressed by silent, uh, by silence uh, or, or the child being moody. Uh, and the transformation is, of course, uh, this uh, exercise in pretending being someone else. Indications of bringing about change. Um, the creative uh, product in play, as, as I said, is, is not the drawing or something else. But it's the, it's the imaginary universe of play, it's the mood that is created, um, and uh, the gaining of experience is uh, typically displayed by the silence or by 
uh, after ending the game, children can sometimes say, uh, I feel like I've become a little bit lonely afterwards. They were with their friends, and then after play, they're becoming lonely. Good. This is my last slide. Uh, last slide. Um, uh, I, I, I came by an idea when I, when I uh, developed uh, the, this presentation. And the idea was that if, they are, if, if these are the effective indicators of play, then maybe a way to observe them, to test them, would be to use uh, music analysis. Music analysis of uh, the moods that music uh, brings about, the style that I expressed uh, in uh, music. And I say that because I've worked with this myself, trying to figure out what are mood, what are uh, judgment uh, style, and so on. And the idea is to say that, that in, muse, in, 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 uh, in music, mood is created by the invariable elements of structure of music. And style seems to be expressed by the variable elements of structure of music. And maybe you can use this as a way to observe play. And uh, when you observe mood, that would be to observe the way the group sounds. The way the group sounds. Is it cheerful? Then their voices would be, it, it's not, it, it, you, 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 you shouldn't listen to what they're saying, but, but how they talk, uh, the, the, the way they sound. Uh, uh, is it fast? Is it high pitch? Is it simple and consonant harmony? Uh, is it in major? Then it's typical of uh, cheerful mood. Is it, on the other hand, loud, uh, complex, dissonant? Then it's enthusiastic, as this moon car turned over. Um, and, and this is a, a, a very... Uh, um, yeah, indicator, I, I think. Uh, disturbance, uh, disturbing mood uh, would be a variant of enthusiastic mood, but with a distortion element and, of course, uh, in minor. Um, if you should try to observe style of uh, play, then you should listen to the way the individuals talk. It is not how the group sounds, but how the individuals talk. Is, uh, are, they, um, uh, are they contributing by laughter and by repeating the other's idea? Then, it's, then it, it is uh, close to imitation style, which is actually typical for electronica, it's my hypothesis. Um, is it contributing with new ideas? Uh, is, it, it seems more to be improvisation style, which is typical of jazz. Thank you. <laughs>